Jamaica's first toll roads did not arrive with Highway 2000. They appeared over a century and a half earlier, around 1838. The history of tolls themselves stretches back much further, all the way to Greek mythology, where Caderon the ferryman charged a toll to carry the dead across the river Acheron. In their writing, Greek scholars Aristotle and Pliny referred to the use of tolls in Asia and Arabia. According to the Arta Sastra, a Sanskrit political treatise, tolls were also said to have existed in 4th century India. Today, many countries use tolls as a means of revenue collection including China, Canada, France, Denmark, Norway, Switzerland, and Austria. A toll is one whose use is monitored by the payment of a fee, generally collected by a toll authority, example, the government. There are also toll bridges and toll tunnels. Tolls were generally manned by toll keepers who lived in toll cottages, cottages adjacent to the toll payment location and were charged with collecting funds. Mr. Bullen, I'm going to buy some lime to help my corn grow better. I can't pay you. I haven't got any money. One horse and cat. Four pence. I haven't got it. Tolls first appeared in the United Kingdom during the 17th century when the term turnpike came into use. A turnpike was originally a gate on which short pikes were placed as a defense against invading cavalry. Although for Americans it simply means a toll road. The British meaning evolved to define the pike or stick that was raised when a toll was paid. Prior to the creation of toll gates, roads in England were mainly poorly maintained dirt tracks that every adult inhabitant of the parish required to work four days each year on the roads using their own tools. The increased use of wheeled vehicles, however, destroyed its upkeep as soon as the work had been completed. In general, the king monasteries or the aristocrats who owned the relevant land were responsible for road maintenance. As a result, not much was done to ensure road quality. The Turnpike Trust with the advent of tolls came a new venture, the Turnpike Trust. Appointed by Parliament as a result of a 1706 Act, the trustees could erect tolls at their own discretion. The idea was that the trustees would borrow money to effect road repairs, although there were no road construction standards to adhere to at the time, and then they would repay it over the time through tolls collected. Although it seemed a simple and efficient system to put designated bodies in charge of road maintenance, the reality was that these debts were rarely repaid, while the trusts were simply renewed as needed. By the mid-18th century, turnpikes had been built on the 13 main roads from London, and in the next few years, close to 400 more were established. By 1825, over 1,000 trusts controlled some 23,000 miles of road in England and Wales, many of which linked major towns. Trusts and tolls were challenged by the advent of the railway, and in the later 19th century, with the last British trust disappearing in 1895, giving way to a road maintenance system overseen by country councils. In America, toll roads began in the late 18th century connecting different states. They peaked in the 19th century and were taken over by highway departments in the early 20th. Post-World War II, new and improved toll road roads were built in the United States heralding the streamlining of the interstate highway system. According to historian Frank Kundal, around 1838 a law was passed to ensure the maintenance of Hope Road. The road leading from Montgomery Corner in Ligonet to the junction of the Oak Road and Og Old Rivers. Montgomery Corner is now known as Crossroads. And the rates were as followed. 10 pence on every wheel, horse, mule, cattle and orange stock. 5 pence on every ass, sheep, goat or pig. This was the first instance of tolls being paid in Jamaica. Although during this period more and more taxes were levied on the peasant class. Peasant carts began to be taxed 18 shillings per year and the taxes on food and clothing were increased 12-fold. The funds collected were used to provide additional services for the plantation owners. Naturally, unrest began to simmer and toll gates were simply another log on that fire. Just like today, tolls were disliked for the weight at the toll gates and also for their cost. 
Some years later, in 1851, a board of commissioners of highways and bridges was appointed to take control of the toll gates. Some toll gates were placed at just strategic locations and roads leading to Savannah Lamar. This meant, however, that many people had to pay tolls each time they went to collect water. In February 1859, the people could take no more. They rioted. For three nights, protesters tore down the toll gates. During the next few months, the riot spread throughout Westmoreland. The Falmouth Post described the participants who destroyed the toll keeper's house and toll gates at Savalamar as ruffians, some dressed in female attire. The Westmoreland police were unable to cope with this challenge. They could neither identify the protesters nor control their actions. Reinforcements had to be sent in from Hanover, Trelawney, St. James and St. Elizabeth. Yet, none of this served to stop the people's objection to tolls. Even when some protesters were brought to trial, such a large crowd of supporters gathered that it was deemed prudent to adjourn the proceedings. By 1863, toll gate legislation had been repealed and the commissioner was ordered to sell the toll houses. Now, we're going to take a look at the Rebecca riots and the, the Welsh influence on our toll riots here in Jamaica. The fact that these protesters dressed in women's clothing could potentially be a link between Jamaican and Welsh history. On May 13, 1839, following a particularly harsh winter and poor harvest in West Wales, Welsh farmers reacted to the increased number of toll gates and increased tolls charge. Supporters dressed in female clothes attacked the toll gates and the toll houses. This was the first of a series of what became known as the Rebecca Riots. Dressing as women ensured protection of their identities, and the biblical symbolism gave their actions a spiritual calling. And they blessed Rebecca and said unto her, Let thy seed possess the gates of those which ate them. And that's in Genesis somewhere. Rebecca and her daughters continued their attacks through the early 1840s, receiving support from the press and censure from law enforcement officials. There was no police force in West Wales at the time. The hero relied instead on a cheaper alternative, the use of special constables and the military if necessary. The toll riots became increasingly violent and troops were called in to restore order. It didn't work. The rioters were simply emboldened and marches to petition magistrates soon followed. The government was forced to take these matters seriously. Promises were made but they didn't quell the energy to strike out against not only toll gates but any who had offended by increasing rents, tides, etc. Soon however, they were sad subdued by the presence of large numbers of troops, the moderating influence of the non-conformist chapels who support the cause but did not condone the violence and the commissioners sent to look into the accounts of the Turnpike Trust also helped to stop the riots in West Rails. Arrests were made, but by this time, the momentum had spread to the southeast, eventually with the use of force. Rebecca and her daughters were also silenced for a time although sporadic outbreaks continued throughout the 19th century in West and North Wales. Eventually, some of the Rebecca lights were brought to trial, some were convicted and sentenced to time in Australia. The commissioners made recommendations that road boards be established in each country to control the roads. In a strange twist of fate, this led to parts of Wales for a time having the honour of having the best road system in Britain. Given the significant press the Rebecca riots received in the United Kingdom, it is easy to believe that word of these actions could have reached the England colonies with Jamaica being no exception. The timing of the Westmoreland Tollgate riots also lends credence to the theory of a Welsh connection. Interestingly, the Welsh rioters were a mixture of educated middle class and poor working class, who received some media support. The Jamaican Westmoreland rioters were mainly peasants, but they too seemed to have received support from media commentators if not from the mainstream press itself. Consider the Falmouth Post. Description of the rioters which reveals bitter contempt. The demolition of the toll gates in the parish of Westmoreland, the pulling down of toll keepers' houses, and the threats held out to persons in authority by a lawless, desperate rabble are events which have resulted from mischievous speeches which have appeared from time to time in the columns of newspapers owned by persons who are always boasting of their patriotism and friendship to the people. This was as cited in Virtue G. 1980. 
Now let's take a look at the Westmoreland unrest. Unlike the Welsh situation, however, the Jamaican Westmoreland toll riots led to the abolition of all toll gates in 1863. Perhaps the strongest reminder of this period in our history is the town of Tollgate, Clarendon. In addition, one historian writing the Gleaner in the 1960s points to tolls as having helped to spearhead the practice of people carrying every loads on their heads. According to him, a toll gate was believed to have stood in the archway of the old fort at Rockfort. Recognizing that pedestrians were exempt from paying tolls with ingenuity that has come to characterize Jamaicans, it is believed that people took to carrying loads of straw, loads in straw baskets on their heads, and passing through a separate space in the fort that was just narrow enough to allow passage. Thus, these pedestrians managed to carry loads and avoid any payment. Also cited in Virtue G, 1980. The Rebecca riots and the Westmoreland Tollgate riots of 1859 are both testimony to the spirit of resistance found amongst people in two countries whose histories share a similar theme of protest. The Welsh have long fought against English control, and the Jamaican peasants, following emancipation, demanded their say in how the country was to be run. It is no surprise, however, that the Marant Bay Rebellion was to follow the Tollgate riots in just a few short years. Thank you again for joining me guys. It's really a pleasure having you here. I really do hope you enjoyed this video. If so please do remember to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss any of my updates. I am Alex. Bless.